blizzard warning Wednesday morning into Thursday evening in the north central and far west and will have an impact on all of us. We're activating our disaster plan. The water is way out of the bank and it's up in the city yard and, and crawling fast. Moderate to major and possibly historic flooding expected to develop. I received a 911 call from the Spencer Dam here on the Niagara River that the dam has been compromised. It's going over the bank. Move to higher ground now. Act quickly to protect your life. We lost the Mormon Canal Bridge west of Niagara. You lost the Mormon Canal Bridge? Niagara is landlocked. Just going to get worse because we've got some tremendous amounts of rainfall, a real nightmare. When the floods came to Nebraska in the middle of March, it seemed to happen all at once. But the waters lingered into autumn. No one doubts this was the worst, but by what measure? Families who lost homes, the number rescued, miles of ruined roads, dollars spent restoring cropland, or the vitality of a main street. In this program, we're telling just a few of the stories of towns overwhelmed and Nebraskans challenged by a natural disaster like no other on the Great Plains. So what happened that week in 2019 when the floods came? The storm wasn't a surprise. The National Weather Service began to see an ominous mix of meteorology. Bill, one of the strongest, most complex weather systems of the entire season is bearing down on Nebraska and will have an impact on all of us. It was a very strong system. We're seeing indications that it was a, perhaps historically strong for a lot of reasons. The amount of moisture it contained, the, the pressure that it fell to, and a lot of indicators suggested that it intensified very rapidly show you our storm system continuing to percolate over Colorado. That's going to head towards the east and northeast. Severe weather, uh, blizzard conditions across the region. Again, a real nightmare. A tight pressure gradient will bring strong winds to the area Wednesday night and during the day Thursday. This mid-latitude cyclone will bring strong winds and wintry precipitation to the area. The term bomb cyclone refers more to a term that isn't within the meteorological community. Um, but what it does refer to is that the storm strengthened very rapidly. At the Niobrara Valley Hospital in Lynch, the staff keeps an eye on weather emergencies. Word of another winter storm watch didn't trigger any alarms. It was raining. Um, really, I didn't think anything twice about it on the rain. The month of February was probably one of the worst ones for snow. So, and, and that was the issue, it was cold and snow. The weather itself that day and that night seemed normal because it was raining. And we've had spring rains. The Straw Bale Saloon became a popular summertime hangout on the south side of the Niobrara River. On this cold day in March, owners Scott Angel and his brother Kenny talked about this winter storm being a little strange. It may seem normal to us, but there were other things going on because this water wasn't going in the ground. The ground was frozen hard, and every bit of it that hit the ground was going to run down the the ground until it hit a creek or a river or a pond. Causing minor flooding of both rural and urban roads. This situation will likely become more widespread tonight and to Wednesday as rainfall increases in aerial coverage and intensity. By Tuesday afternoon, the Weather Service advised streams could rise rapidly in 30 counties from South Dakota to the border with Kansas these lighter green areas. These are flood warnings that are already in effect for some of the area rivers over eastern Nebraska. So again, this is just going to get worse. Because we knew that none of this was going to end well. Earl Immler became the state's coordinating officer at the command center for the Nebraska Emergency Management Agency. We made the decision to stand up the state emergency operations center to bring in the emergency support function coordinators. Governor Ricketts signed an emergency proclamation putting the machinery of state government in motion. Photographer and storm chaser John Haxby knew days earlier this would be a busy week providing video documenting snow, wind, rain, and floods. It was about 5, 6 in the morning it transitioned to snow, and then it was heavy, wet snow, and then we had 40 to 60 mile an hour wind gusts on top of that. So it, 
it hurt. It, it was painful to be out in that. We are right off the Kearney Exchange where we have wind gusts up to 49 miles an hour. As the blowing snow made travel a treacherous risk, barricades went up in stages along Interstate 80. Early in the morning on Wednesday, the Weather Service sent out an unusually strongly worded advisory. Moderate to major and possibly historic flooding expected to develop. Wow, this is going to be historical flooding. You don't hear historical that often. When I say a rain event, look at the rain. One to three inches of rain possible over eastern Nebraska with the frozen ground and the snow melt. This is really going to cause some problems. The ground was frozen. We had a deep frost this year. And uh, so the water couldn't get absorbed into the ground. All the farm ponds were iced over. The, the, the creeks were iced over. Knox County Sheriff's Office. Yes, this is Max at Knox County Road Department. Knox. You do know the road is closed up north on 531. Okay, you guys are closing it completely? It is closed completely. This one was flooding everywhere. Never before had the Verdigre Creek been so high, seven feet higher than any previous record. The mayor declared an emergency and evacuated the entire village. Hi, uh, this is our home in the mayor of Verdigre. We're at a state of emergency here. The main street of Verdigre was flooded. The, the north bridge going into Verdigre was underwater. The south bridge going into Verdigre had water up to the bottom of it. We are evacuating the fire all at this time. We do not have every command spot at right yet. Nowhere in this county was immune from this uh, storm that came through. Nor was Boyd County a safe place. The 170 people living in Lynch, Nebraska, tucked most of their homes between the Ponca Creek and Whiskey Creek. The streams merge on the east side of town. They've come up in the past, yeah, but uh, it's uh, they've always been contained and nothing really major. Kelly Kelkowski started getting nervous about how the rising water was behaving this time. This was going to be something that was going to be different than what we've had in the past. He made the call to clear out the hospital and get help. I went to the hospital and the water was still coming, so I called for mutual aid from other towns to come help sandbag and to help get evacuate other people throughout the town. In town, dozens of people scrambled to get belongings above the water line that wouldn't stop rising. You could see the water running across the roads. Every so often, you could see ice chunks sticking out of the water. And some of them were floating, but some of them weren't. Back at the hospital, they didn't think they could build a wall fast enough. The water just kept surrounding the hospital. It was getting deeper. And finally, they got to the point where the payloaders just started dumping sand with just right where they could and hoping that it save it. The sandbags held, the water stayed out. The hospital in itself would have looked like it was an island, on its own little island. 102.9 KBRX, I got uh, Officer Rachel Coleman in the studios with us this morning. Good morning. I Good wish it was morning. Under, I wish it was under better conditions, but it's not. No, the, it's terrible out there. I, I, we advise no travel, no travel at this time. Rain gauges in Boyd and Knox County collected over two inches of rain in over 24 hours. The Niobrara River, frozen solid after weeks of Arctic temperatures, came to life. We saw in the Niobrara River the, uh, an abrupt rise happening, and we were scratching our heads trying to figure out, is that real? Is that backwater from ice? Is that really something happening? The ice started breaking up, and it started moving down, and all the ice that wasn't loose all come down and caught every bridge. Mounds of ice blocks covered the Highway 11 bridge. It lifted a section of the Stuart Naper Bridge a quarter mile downstream. Since 1927, the Niobrara River had filled the reservoir behind the Spencer Dam. The stream flow powered a small hydroelectric plant. On this day, the metal gates blocked the momentum of the winter's worth of ice. It could take no more. Knox County Sheriff's Office. I received a call from the Spencer Dam here on the Niagara River that the dam has been compromised. It's going over the doors, um, it's busted through a couple doors, and it's going over the dike. The dam is breaking. It did take time to hear about it, and so we relied on the stream gauging network to really know that, wow, something big was coming. The guys at the power plant said that the dam is completely gone. 
and they said there was water running over the bridge. Then we realized uh, we're not getting data anymore because our, our river gauge got ripped out. They took out our gauge and the next gauge after that. Uh, kind of just a, a, a big massive wave of water rolling through with ice chunks. We knew that at that point that we were probably dealing with some forces that we hadn't dealt with before as far as what Mother Nature can throw at you. They came in and woke me up, said the Spencer Dam, we just got a call, the Spencer Dam is broke and uh, we, need to, we need to figure out what we got to do. Hey Jerry, this is Kendra down at the Sheriff's Office in the Center. We're calling everybody that we can across the Niobrara. We put together a game plan and the dispatcher jailer started calling everybody within a mile on each side of the river. My thoughts were, if we can make it through this without getting anybody killed, I, I, that'll be my goal, to not have anybody get killed in this whole mess. But one person had already been lost. The night before, Kenny Angel stayed at the house next to the straw bale, just 1,500 feet southeast of the dam. About 10 after 7, a, a deputy showed up from O'Neill, and about 20 after, there was enough daylight that we could finally look over there and see that the house was uh, completely gone. The bar was gone. And there was nothing left. An ice-cold lava flow spread out a mile wide, taking out the saloon and Kenny's house, slowly lurching downstream. mile and a half wide, 15 foot plus tall and growing ice jam on the Navarro River. 20 miles east of the dam, the Rizitschka farm weathered a century of Nebraska's harshest weather. The night before, they thought the worst was over. Then news of the ice flow. I mean, we got out of here at the last second. I mean, a minute to another second, second, another minute, we probably would have drowned. We just run, we had so many things that we needed to do, but you just run. I got to the top of the hill over there, and I turned around and looked back, and it looked like an ocean down here, and I just started bawling. I mean, I just started bawling. I sat there for quite a while. I didn't know what to do. I was so shocked. Yeah, we'll figure it out. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Though. I'm not giving up. No. No. I'm not giving up. It looked like a war zone when you have giant ice that's flowing through houses and left mud and debris. Send the page out now that the, the ice dam and the current is moving towards Niobrara now. It took seven hours for the water from the Spencer Dam to hit Niobrara. And when it hit, we didn't know if anything was going to be salvageable in the community of Niobrara. The Niobrara takes a hard turn north before flowing under the Mormon Bridge on Highway 12 and into the Missouri River. The popular Country Cafe sat on the lowlands west of town. At 7 o'clock on Thursday morning, Gary Nielsen, who has a uh, Nielsen grain across from me, called and he said, Laura, we're going to get wiped out. Look at that. That is just insane. The cafe is still... It's still, the, still there. The, the ice surrounded it. Yeah. There ain't nothing moving there. Yep. It didn't look like anything that should have been in northeast Nebraska. That was probably the worst for me to watch. I mean, can you imagine watching your hometown be destroyed? People kept calling and telling me, watch the video, there goes your roof. So it was pretty devastating to hear that news and not knowing because you couldn't get down there to see. Stunned spectators on the west side of Highway 12 watched the Mormon Bridge lazily float away, severing an economic lifeline to the village. Iceberg after iceberg coming in there, and uh, just massive, I mean, it, it was like a bulldozer going through, a big bulldozer, and just leveling everything that got in the way. The power, the, the way you feel, I mean, that's Mother Nature at her worst. It, it makes you wonder, what more could ever happen? Ordinarily, the collapse of Spencer Dam would have been the topic at every coffee shop in the state. Local 4 at 5 starts now. 
throughout much of the state. Countless people have been rendered helpless due to severe flooding, and Howard County was one of the hardest hit. This year, everyone had their own simultaneous hometown crisis unfolding. The past 24 hours have been very active with flooding, snow, ice, and more. But where do we stand looking forward as far as wind and possibly more flooding, Tim? Yeah, you know, the snow is starting to depart the area, but the winds remain just as we expected. In addition to that, we've got widespread flash flood warnings, flood warnings, and flood advisories. Really, the entire uh, eastern two-thirds of Nebraska under some, uh, some type of warning or advisory. On March 13th, the cruel combination of ice, snow, and rain flooded nearly every stream and creek, delivered millions of gallons into the sloping basin containing three branches of the Loop River before it joins the Platte River near Columbus. That included 60 miles of meandering Beaver Creek flowing past St. Edward, a pioneer outpost once called Waterville. I've lived here 30 years, grew up four miles west of town, uh, talked to people that are 93 years old in town and nobody can remember something like this. St. Ed's businesses line Beaver Street. Right after lunch that Wednesday, security cameras outside Big Iron Auction kept watch as the creek moved into town. That's Wirtz Grocery across the street, one of the oldest businesses in town. George Wirtz stayed as long as he could as water moved up the aisles. Up the street is Sheila Hosher's hair salon. I was in here when it was coming up. One minute you looked outside and the next minute my car had water on the floorboards just that fast. They had me sandbagged in and I had to knock on the door and have the firemen let me out because I stayed here not realizing how fast that was coming up. The water covering the road blocked Jeanette Stoltz from getting home. She got out of her car to take some video. The railroad tracks, the, the, it was dinging, the lights were flashing, you know, and really loud. There's a pontoon boat moored curbside at a stop sign, an infant scooter drifting away, the frantic sandbagging at the front door of the bank, everyone frigid in the flow of ice water. It was just going by my house like a raging river, you know, just really going fast. It was just a nightmare. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I could just picture all my things in the house just getting ruined, which that's what happened. The levee in St. Edward held, but the water made a joke of it by rushing around both ends. Get over here. <laughs> Help the old woman get her hands. Candy just Dormy case. lived just north of the business district. So I laid down for 30 minutes, and I woke up to a funny gurgly noise. Gurgle, gurgle. What's gurgle, gurgle? And I sat up, and there was water coming up the vent, heater vent in my bedroom at the base of my bed. And I'm like, oh, this is not good. And we had that 40 pound bag of cat litter. I would advise people, don't try to stop the flood with the cat litter. Candy sat in a chair by her front door, trying to keep her feet out of the freezing water. You see this mud line here? Mud water. Until she was rescued in the bucket of a front end loader. I haven't broke down yet. I hope I don't, but you never know, I might. St. Edward took a beating to the streets, homes that may never be occupied again, businesses that may be too far gone to fix. I guess, thank God for every day that you get. Don't take life for granted. And we're fortunate we didn't lose any people. No loss of human life, but the toll on farm animals in the area shocked the senses. By noon, we've seen that we had more water coming in. Uh, by two, three o'clock, uh, the ice moved in, pushed all the cattle into the water. Mike Kaminsky's farm and cattle operation on the west side of the Middle Loop River in Sherman County maintains a herd of 300 or so cows. They grazed and calved on ground that had never been flooded before. This time, the river rose all day. By mid-afternoon, it was pandemonium. We couldn't respond quick enough to what was going on down here. The channel of the river basically started coming across our property. With it brought all the ice and you could hear it was like a uh, train coming off the tracks. Kaminsky did the only thing he felt he could, document the loss of his herd, his family's livelihood, 
because he knew it would be impossible for others to believe what they were seeing, an ice flow carrying the animals away. The cows were running into the water um, and they were, I, I've never heard cows beller like that. It, it wasn't uh, a, a normal sound. It was uh, a panic that they were in. They're all dead. Attempting to save the animals risked the lives of the Kaminsky family. 22 cow-calf pairs were lost to the river. This is the only cow that we found alive. Probably the most humbling thing is knowing that you had absolutely no power to do what you wanted to do. You, you couldn't come out and save them. I don't know if she's a little upset or crazy, I don't know. It was uh, absolutely heart-wrenching to, to see it happen. About 25 miles downstream from Mike Kaminsky is Danabrog, another town hemmed in by two fickle rivers. Dense fog lingered that morning, and the no-nonsense weather forecasts made Lori Larson uneasy. We paid attention. You could just feel that something was going on and something was happening. It's looking a little rough in Danabrog. This creek is normally like 10 feet down. It's almost into the park there. After a day of relentless rain, the mayor, Carol Schroeder, heard the bad news. Oak Creek steadily filling and quickening. She's a health care administrator. Her husband, Tom, runs the bakery and pizza place. I called Tom and said, you don't have to leave, but be prepared to leave. Get everything up off, the, off of the floor, the main floor, put things on the table, and I'll start heading home. Then the rivers took on a life of their own. Additional rain may cause the ice jam to break and cause rapid rises along the Loop River. Flash flooding is expected to begin shortly. When Terry came to my house at 8.30 um, and told me they were calling off the sandbagging and said we can't keep up, and he said I've got to get the men home before they can't get home. During the voluntary evacuation, most got out while they could. Through the night, the town's Facebook page became one of the few ways people could get information about their neighbors. My daughter and I run the Facebook page, and so updating on Facebook, we obviously couldn't get to the other end of town. And so we were the eyes and ears on this end of town. And so I continually was taking pictures and watching the water. Larson worked from her iPad in the living room while her daughter posted in the bedroom. Howard County being told don't travel on most roads because of flooding. We were flooded all of Thursday, so we really kind of became a ghost town. There wasn't much activity. Most people had evacuated. The next morning, the water remained. Main Street became part of the river. There was a lot of force to it, and just the extent of time it was there, I knew there was going to be more damage. I knew what, what we were gonna see in these businesses were worse. Over 50 houses filled at least to the ceiling, three to eight feet of water in all of those houses. Water causes damage just from the power of that, but everything's soaking longer, and we knew it was contaminated water. We knew there was sewer in it. Two of the roads off of Highway 58 have been closed, and there's only one way into town from here. I spoke to the Howard County emergency manager, and they say that they've run out of barricades for the amount of closures they've had. That same Wednesday afternoon, the North Loop River charged east, engorged with water and 100 miles of built-up ice slabs and debris. I mean, there's trees and stuff going down. They're just zipping right on through, just like a car going by. What did it sound like? It was roaring pretty bad. In the aftermath, Jamie Klingensmith broadcast live on Facebook from the Lake of the Woods development. You can see where the river has completely washed out our road. Their neighbor's home had been a safe thousand feet from the riverbank. Their car is in the river right now. A few doors down, a riverside home had been ripped from its foundation. Past where the north branch joins the loop, 
ice becomes an annual hazard where the public power district diverts water from the river into a canal powering hydroelectric generators. On March 13th, a series of ice jams put unheard of pressure on the 70-year-old structure. I got a call from a neighbor here telling me that he was down by the Loop River Bridge and he said as far as upstream as you can see and as far downstream, he said there was an ice jam. Inside the Loop Public Power Headworks, a grouping of gates controls river flow entering the canal. Water moving at 1,000 cubic feet per second, 10 times the normal flow, causes the structure to shudder. Worst case scenario is it fills the canal up and you cannot control the flow into the canal. The sandbag crew got out. Within minutes, the river carved a whole new channel around the diversion. To be truthful, it was beyond what you could even imagine with pictures. It's amazing what that power of water can do. The flood punched five additional breaches into the sides of the 35 mile long canal, spreading water across hundreds of acres of farmland and highways. With the roads washed out, Andy Zarek had to be flown in by helicopter. They flew us in and they dropped me off first in the helicopter. That's when I seen it, Friday morning. This was the place where he'd worked since high school the caretaker's home where he'd been raising his family. Piled on a trailer, a few possessions snatched from the wreckage. You know, this is all I've known for over half my life. This is all I've done. And then you got all your family stuff in that house and your kids and your wife and everything you have, you know, personal and employment wise, you start to wonder, you know, what the heck? because you can't go home because it's gone. And this is like a second home, so, and this is part ways gone, so what do you do? Where do you start? All of the misery across central and northern Nebraska in just 36 hours. Historic flooding records had already been broken at 17 locations. What you have to understand is, yeah, we knew it was big, in the Emergency Management Operations Center, the insane number of crisis calls came in from across the state. We knew this was something we hadn't experienced, but when you're in that moment, you've got a job to do and you're pushing with that. I was extremely proud of the people that worked in there. They worked to solve problems. They worked in a very cohesive and collaborative way. You had folks from Department of Transportation, the State Patrol, Nebraska Guard, working these problems and figuring solutions to them. How are we going to get this taken care of? By the end of the first two days, the water claimed two more lives. Platt County farmer James Wilkie volunteered to rescue someone trapped in a vehicle. The cold, deep waters of Shell Creek swept Wilkie away. Rescuers could not reach 80-year-old Betty Hammernick in her home near the Loop River before she passed away. Flash flood statement. The rapid rises expected along the Platte River have flattened out heading downstream. However, the river is still rising as flood waters continue to pour in from further upstream. It was Thursday, March 14th. As dozens of smaller streams filled Nebraska's largest rivers, communities like Valley, trapped between the Elkhorn and Platte, had the luxury of a couple of hours of warning instead of just minutes. So you had time to think about all this as what's coming downstream. The storm passed and skies were clear, but the larger communities in eastern Nebraska prepared to get slammed. Pretty much I woke up to a phone call to my mom saying, hey, we got to get the heck out of here. People didn't know what to do other than th they would back their trucks up to the front door of their house, throw everything they possibly could, and they would take off. People are in a panic. Everything that I can live without is still in the house, uh, but hopefully it doesn't get too high that I lose everything. The hard part about this whole thing is you really can't see what's coming. I mean, um, you know it's coming, but you really don't know the scope of it until it gets here. 
it was moving that fast. So when a levee breaks, you tell people, you need to get out, you need to move now. By Friday, even the meteorologists at the National Weather Service office in Valley packed up to escape the flood. There's one shot that I, I put the camera down on the ground, down by Valley, and I'm watching this water come over the top and, and start rising. And it's, it's like, like it's alive as it's coming downstream toward you. The surge overtook one bridge after another, sealing off Fremont from the rest of Nebraska. Some saw it coming and fled. One of the critical places was Fremont, you know, simply because the only way you could get in and out of Fremont there for a period was, was through, by air. I called it the island of Fremont. At first it was panic, but then it was everybody's going to pull together, we're going to make this work, we're going to pull all the resources together, everything that we have, and we're going to help each other. And everybody was in a good mood. Everyone left behind understood the risk and the task at hand. The rivers were only getting higher. Hard work became the only defense. The hard part is all the ways in and out of town are covered with water. So we're kind of all just stuck here until it goes down. And then it just keeps creeping in on us. Levees and dams keep breaking. And so it just keeps getting worse. Oh, I think it's a miracle. I think these guys are busting their butts and doing the great work for this community. Fremont strong, I tell you that. There was a fear factor that Fremont was just totally gonna to be lost. There's no high point in Fremont. It may be within two or three feet would be it, but it would just roll down into downtown. It would come in from the west side. By Saturday morning, floods came anyway. Flash flood emergency for Fremont. Residents are urged to move to higher ground now. The water washed through one of Fremont's poorest neighborhoods. And right here it's always been quiet, but this happened out of nowhere so fast. It was pretty scary for, honestly, a lot of people. Some of the recent immigrants had no idea a flood was even possible. I'm so scared too, because this is the first time when I see this situation of the United States. So it's a little bit hard when the family, they lost all of them, house, car, and it's hard. And you have a language barrier in a lot of situations. But a lot of people, either they didn't understand or they thought they could make it through, so they didn't get out. In fact, there were hundreds of people who did not follow the warnings issued hours, even days before they found themselves trapped. Just get what you can and get out. There's a few people that chose to stay out here, so prayers and best wishes to them. We told them to leave yesterday and they refused, so now we're putting our lives and equipment in jeopardy trying to get the people out who refused to leave yesterday. Rescues, the daring kind that usually make front page news in any town, became frighteningly common over three days in Nebraska. They have a concern for their property, for their livestock, for their, for their pets, those kind of things, so you have a tendency, it's a human nature to want to hang on at, right there until the last minute. Don's asking if you're able to get your boat out and ready if need be. If not, we'd understand. Yeah, it's been ready to go. The O'Neill Fire Department pulled off this improvised extraction. These were long, frightening waits for those trapped in their home, unsure when the waters would creep a little higher minute by minute. As I'm watching water rise here and water rush by out there with debris and chunks of ice in it, I had a thought. I wonder if this is how they felt on the Titanic. Ice was as much of a problem as water in villages like Lynch with frozen creeks. I had one lady and she was in a wheelchair. It was dark, it was like 11 o'clock at night. The wind's blowing, the water's rushing around the house. Ice was on the road blocking the way out so they couldn't get out with their vehicles. They had to leave their vehicles. The Nebraska State Patrol participated in 163 rescues during the floods. Hundreds of other calls were made by sheriffs and volunteer fire departments. We got stranded people uh, throughout that area. We strongly, 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 urgently, please do not enter any water with your vehicles. When a stranded motorist needed rescue, here's the weather faced by the Gothenburg fire crew.
The caller said there's four foot white caps on the river itself, and you know, a lot of ice floating around. I, I don't think going out on the river is an option. You had the force of the water, you had the ice coming down. The water was so swift, it was eroding a lot of the roads out right underneath these people, and you couldn't tell it. So some of them would actually drive off into a rut, and it would just, it would strand them, so they'd have to be rescued also. We had several incidents where we were having local fire departments going out to try and rescue someone and then end up in a bad circumstance themselves because they've just never dealt with the type of flooding issues and the currents that we had here. In the first 48 hours, small town first responders took on rescues in fast water they had never been trained to handle. By the third day, when the waters spread wider and deeper from the Elkhorn, the Loop, and the Platte, it was time to deploy the Nebraska National Guard. Well, the way it happens, someone's in their house. There's water rushing around it. They just woke up and they're wet. They call 911, that goes to county dispatch. County dispatch then alerts our personnel at NEMA and says, hey, we've got people here, they're trapped, we can't get to them. I didn't think I would ever see in my career a time when we were literally pulling people off of rooftops with helicopters. I, I didn't think we would experience that in Nebraska. I think we had winds sustained 45, gusting above 60. Often, um, we don't train in those winds and helicopters. The rising waters would not wait for morning. For people trapped in homes on remote county roads, real fear crept in overnight. Who's going to be okay through the night and who needs to be rescued tonight? Uh, who can't wait till the morning? And you know, as we were kind of prioritizing, uh, they needed to get out of there. A lot of those we did the first night were not 911 calls. It was simply going out and finding people in distress. They assume no one's coming to rescue them because it's 11 o'clock at night, it's dark and it's really windy. And they're looking and we put a spotlight on the house and they go, there's a helicopter flying right now? I don't think we had called more than 15 minutes ago. All of a sudden I heard it outside. I, I went outside and they were looking for a place to land. And we had a dry enough spot, he dropped down and in and out. I saw so many people coming out of there that they were just sopping wet. These people were just happy to be alive and, and be in a safe spot, a dry spot especially. They took a lot of pride in helping these people, not just another number and go make another rescue. You know, they personally took pets. That I said I wasn't leaving unless the dogs go. <laughs> it's a crisis for other animals, the livestock which were left behind. They had livestock that were isolated and had been isolated for quite several days. Those that survived the first rush of water instinctively went to what little high ground remained, but their source of food had vanished. The floodwaters were still rushing through some of these areas. They were so deep you couldn't get equipment in there. So what the guard was doing was literally putting uh, the big round bales on the CH-47s, the Chinooks, the big dual rotor helicopters and loading them up and doing hay drops to feed cattle. Fremont had been cut off on Friday. By the end of Saturday, the Platte River inundated the National Guard's training facility, Camp Ashland. Estimated repairs, $62 million. Up to nine feet of water washed into Offutt Air Force Base after the levees failed. So the water lifted the file cabinet up onto my desk. Estimated repairs, $420 million. The major commuter routes from Omaha's suburbs into the city shut down. $20 million of the estimated $100 million needed to fix the state's roads and bridges. As the Missouri spread higher and wider than ever before, it took out water treatment plants in Plattsmouth and Peru. Only with airlifted sandbags was the Cooper nuclear power plant able to hold the water back. Farmers with rich riverfront farmland never planted this year because the water never left. We're getting ready this time to, to plant in a couple weeks on a normal year, but now it's, uh, it's gonna be weeks, months before the water goes away from here. It was time to clean up. A couple of weeks after the floods came to Danabrog, a quick tour through town might deceive a visitor. He had about eight inches on his main floor. On the main floor? Yeah. Walking with building inspectors through stripped-down homes, 
revealed the damage done by two rivers worth of water. As far as I can see, the center wall has collapsed. 50 homes damaged, a third of the housing stock in town. Give me a percentage of damage for this. 80, well, realistically, probably. Well, with that foundation being gone, that's a yeah. large part of it, so that's pretty accurate. On Main Street, an assessor from the federal Small Business Administration examined damage at the Archer Credit Union. The basement filled with water first, and actually I watched all my security cameras come up through wow. the floor in that first room. Is there too much structural damage that it wouldn't allow us to reopen? And that's a big concern, especially being the, the only credit financial institution in, in town. I think as people start coming in and you start hearing those stories, and you start realizing what they lost and wondering how, how do we come back from this? You can see it in the faces, you know. It, it, when we first came back in that Saturday, you know, there's, everybody broke down. Floods weren't new to Dan and Brog, and strange as it sounds, it may have prepared the village. The town's leadership understood what was at stake, making every business on Main Street whole again. In no time, work began to pump water out of the basements and clear mud from the floors. The pizza ovens in Tom Schroeder's bakery were intact. The building was a mess. We got everything dry. We, we washed it all down. In the kitchen, we pulled up the floor all the way down to the floor, all the way down to the first floor boards. But Dana Brog couldn't afford to lose the only grocery store or the only bar and grill. We need them and I need these people to stay. And same with the homeowners. I thought, don't move. Don't walk away from this property. Along every street in town, mounds of ruined personal belongings piled up curbside. Seeing that stuff on the street was just so crushing. There were fridges and beds and sofas and furniture and people's lives were out there on the curbs. The village board decided to clear the streets almost overnight. I think it was important to say, we'll pay for that. You don't have to pay for that garbage. And that wasn't all that expensive. I mean, it's close to $10,000 by the time we paid for all that. But we needed to make that gesture to help them. We're not going to stand there and wait for FEMA or NEMA or anybody else to show up. We just roll up our sleeves and we do what needed to be done. Dana Brog typified the wary side eye given the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Skepticism mingled with hope for financial aid. Up in Knox and Boyd counties, hearing news of more urban areas getting FEMA's attention felt like a slight when some disaster declarations took longer than hoped. We're just sitting here every day wondering, well, are they going to stop it? I don't know if FEMA has forgotten about Northeast Nebraska. It took a long time for them to realize that they needed additional help but um, all the focus does seem to be on the more populated areas of the state. That's not the case whatsoever. And to be honest, we are very sensitive to that perception. President Trump appointed Connie Johnson Cage to coordinate FEMA's response in Nebraska. To make sure that everyone knows that they are all going to receive the same level of benefits as the next county. So it has nothing to do with any socioeconomic borders or anything of the sorts. We're here to support everyone. Yeah. While some complained about FEMA's slow response, hundreds of Nebraskans were slow to register and apply for aid. A lot of times we do not want to ask for help, and we've learned that here in Nebraska. There are certain communities that have, were heavily impacted by the floods, and, and, the, um, and they're just not asking for help. State and local disaster teams don't come into a town unless they're invited. Some in Danabrog were vocal about not wanting government inspectors in their homes. I think FEMA and NEMA are a little bit scary to some people, probably because it's government. Mayor Schroeder worked with Howard County's emergency manager to organize a town meeting at the Baptist Church that the floodwaters had spared. They planned for 40 and 120 showed up. It was bigger than I thought it would be. I got feedback that said, I'm not gonna let them in my house. You know, and I don't blame you guys, I really don't. Because you guys have been through hell, seriously. I think I could see some people that had some questions almost ready to argue. I want this and I want that, and how are you gonna help me? What, what are you gonna do for me? FEMA doesn't write in and give you a $100,000 check. I am sorry, 
but I want to set that expectation right away, okay? The maximum award amount for FEMA individual assistance is $34,000. It changed to what can we do and where, where is their help, but what can we do now and how can we help each other? I, I really felt like people left there with some hope. Well before that money arrived, Main Street Danabrog opened for business. The grocery stayed open. Once the pizza ovens at Tom Schroeder's bakery fired up, people showed up for chocolate chip cookies and pizza. The Waterlog Credit Union was cashing checks again. I just feel like it could have been so much worse in Danabrog than it was. So I feel very blessed that we've come out as good as we have and that people did stay and people are rebuilding their businesses. St. Edward took it hard. 83 homes took water, some declared unfit to live in without substantial repairs. The ones on the floodplain, like Jeanette Stoltz's place, will need thousands of dollars in improvements to meet building codes. I'm the only one left on the block here. <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna do. I like this town, I don't want to leave this town. I want to stay here. I just, I just wish I could get some money to fix my foundation. 31 businesses were flooded, but streets and utilities had limited damage. So places like Wirtz Grocery were up and running within a few days. At one point, I think we had about 30 volunteers in here doing that. And it's just, it really is truly amazing of what stuff can happen and get done when you got that many people volunteering. So. The beauty salon was back. The Beaver Dam Bar and Grill made progress with its mess, hoping to get beer and burgers back on the menu. A lot of hard work to keep our town alive because if you don't have the businesses or the people living here, you don't have a town. Then reality hit St. Edward. The bar would not be reopening. The building owners and tenants couldn't make the numbers work and bring it back to life. Every time it came down to feeling like we're letting the community down, this kind of took the cake. I mean, this was a magnitude that we, we uh, couldn't foresee and never in our wildest dreams would have thought would have happened. The antique and secondhand store across the street shut down. The historic office of the newspaper, The Advance, can't be reoccupied. It may not be directly related to the flooding, but one of the town's biggest employers, Warner Service and Trucking, shut down in St. Ed. On the upside, a new community center is on the way. Voters approved a bond issue to make it happen just a month before the flood. It doesn't have to be a tipping point, it's a turning point. They have the mindset to, to persevere. They just, they won't give up. Recovery in one place meant responding to a $20 million emergency. As water drained from streets and fields along the Loop River, the battered levees and diversion dam feeding Loop Public Power's generators could do little to contain the water flowing into neighboring land. You're kind of taken aback, I would say, because it's like nothing can do that much damage. And then you see it and you're like going, wow. And then you start thinking about, okay, how are we gonna fix it? CEO Neil Seuss faced an urgent set of problems. Short term, his crew needed to plug the massive holes on either side of the diversion dam. Seuss turned to his director of operations. It's like putting a pinky in a, in a flow in the Missouri River. It's not gonna stop anything. And he looked at me and says, yeah, but we gotta do something. The National Guard stepped up, delivering equipment and dropping massive sandbags into place where trucks could not navigate ruined roads. And then they get it in place, you're like going, hey, this is actually going to work and it's actually going to succeed. The emergency repairs held, but by the end of the summer, the canal to the electric plants remained at only half its capacity, limiting the amount of electricity the system can generate. Work on permanent fixes won't be done for at least a year. But I really feel now that we are in a, in a place where I'm much more calm. Two counties that got hit first, got hit hard. In Boyd County, the failure of Spencer Dam took out a vital transportation link to the rest of the state. It also severed the main water line serving the area. There's a quarter of a mile through there that the line's gone. The water district jerry-rigged a system that temporarily provided drinkable water, but remained at about half its capacity. 
replacing the pipelines dragged on through the summer. The total cost, $2 million. Boyd County's rural roads and three bridges were torn up by the storm. The Board of Supervisors met an emergency session in April to hear from the engineers making the damage estimate. I guess we'll start off with the sticker shock. Total is about 4.4 million. More than an entire year's budget in a county with barely 2,000 people living here. We're gonna have to be real creative, I guess. We don't know yet. We're working on it. Because everybody depends on the roads to get to down everywhere and kids to school and mail delivered. And so we gotta do something. The cost for road repair in Boyd County does not include the additional million dollars needed by the tiny village of Lynch with its flooded utilities and streets left behind looking like dry creek beds. For weeks, state highways near the northern border remained roads to nowhere with a make or break summer tourism season just a few weeks away. The lost bridges spanning the Niobrara feed the local economy. That's probably going to hinder us more than anything. I think that'll be the biggest challenge, getting our roads functional to get people, people through the area. By the end of summer, temporary bridges open to limited traffic, and building the permanent new lanes was underway. The happiest stories are those driven by generosity and the drive to survive. In Niobrara, the roof of the country cafe, encased in ice, became a symbol of the ferocity of this historic cyclone. After clearing out the icebergs, volunteers went to work rebuilding walls, replacing the kitchen, redecorating the dining room for a summertime grand reopening. March 13th, did you think you'd see this day? No, not at first. And you know, my son, my oldest son, he says, Mom, you can do this. <laughs> I'm happy to have my job back. I'm happy to see all the smiling faces come yeah. through here. Oh, he made it. Thank you. Let's face it, it was a bad year in Nebraska. This is going to be something 100 years from now. They're going to talk about this historical flooding from this year. You want to be able to snap your finger and just have everything go back to normal right here and now, but we know that isn't going to happen. What was going to help? Across the state, people just showed up to do whatever needed to be done. We have been feeding people three meals a day since this all began. Uh, we just started, it was just a group of us that just started coming in and what can we do? Let's get people fed that don't have homes or have staying with other people. I would never wish this on anybody, but I was glad that I was able to see it and uh, the generosity to our community and the people's generosity. All just donations from Omaha to a small town that they've never even heard of. We had neighbors who hadn't talked to each other for literally years, who couldn't get along, who were hugging each other and, and uh, helping each other. Uh, it's just, it's been amazing to watch. Help came from across town and across the country. Nonprofits, faith organizations, brand name businesses, a coalition of international chefs showed up in Fremont doing what they do best, cook. Total strangers treated to a fresh meal. It was obvious that there was um, some despair and some clear heartache and just being able to help provide them with a meal for today, for lunch, um, seems to make their day just a little bit easier. You know, it feels really good that people care, that people are out there that are willing to give a lot from their time and out of their lives to come and help other people that are in need. We're building relationships with people that maybe we didn't know. And that we can become a better neighbor, a better citizen, a better human being that way. After six generations on the same land in Boyd County, it looked bleak for the Rizitschka farm after the crush of ice leveled the homestead. The friends and strangers just showed up. They're the heroes, and they are neighbors, the whole community, the whole state of Nebraska. They're the ones, they're our heroes. National media attention brought in cash and supplies to rebuild everything from the cattle pens to the main house by the end of the summer. Financially, it's probably gonna ruin me, but I'm not gonna quit. I, I, I'm not gonna break the chain. Six generations, 
Maybe they've even had it tougher than I got it right now. You want to quit, but I'm not going to quit.